and, and, and also early Quakers in England had been very severely persecuted. Mm. And so Hunter even says this. His father says his father told me, hey, you know, what church should I join? His father had left the Quakers himself. Oh, yeah, find the church, you know, that is really, really gets persecuted. Well, the Mormons show up <laughs> in 38 when terrible stuff's going on in Missouri. And there was a lot of sympathy in the area, right? Even those who really didn't like Mormonism thought that, you know, it was terrible what had happened to them, right? Well, for a lot of people, they were like, well, maybe this is the true church because this isn't this what the church should, should be like. Hmm. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Saints Unscripted. We are here today with Steve Fleming. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. And um, before we get into our topic, maybe maybe I'll just have you introduce yourself. Maybe just tell us where you're from and um, and give us a little bit of background on uh, maybe your education and, and your kind of field of study when it comes to Latter-day Saint history. Okay. Uh, yeah, I went to BYU. Went to BYU. Um, I hadn't been very interested... Uh, I was a history major and, and, and really, really loved history. Had not been that interested in Latter-day Saint history until I was thumbing through a book which got us on the topic we're talking about today, which was the, it, uh, it mentioned Mormons in um, uh, New Jersey in the 1840s. And so that became my project that I did for my final paper that they had us do as undergraduate history majors. I wrote an article on that. I then discovered that uh, the Mormons were quite successful in central New Jersey, uh, that that was part of a larger unit of success that uh, was centered in Philadelphia. Philadelphia was kind of the center. And so I then studied the whole area for my, my I went and got my master's at uh, Cal State Stanislaus and uh, studied that whole area and got to go back there and, and uh, look at a bunch of stuff uh, back in, in, in uh, that area. So there was a series of a lot of success in central New Jersey, Philadelphia, southeastern Pennsylvania, and northern Delaware were, were a bunch of success. And you're from California? I am not. I'm from here. I, well, from I live here. Okay. I, I currently live in California. Okay. I grew up, grew up here. And then I went off and got my PhD and worked on another topic in Mormon history. Gotcha. Which, but we're talking about this other one, right? Sure. And, and you're <laughs> currently a bishop, right? Yeah. How's that going? Um, well... <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it. That's that's a that's an interesting uh, job too. But uh, but I could go probably on and on about that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, it's good to serve in the church. So. It is. It can be a challenge sometimes. Mm. I do find it challenging. Yeah. This particular calling. <laughs> I bet. I bet. That's why I keep the beard to discourage any. <laughs> that didn't. That didn't. That didn't end up working for me. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> so okay. So today's topic. You touched on it a little bit, but so here's why I, I stumbled upon some of your publications on uh -huh. this, and I was interested because when we talk about church history, when I talk about church history, because I have a whole segment where I talk about history and stuff, um, we generally talk about. Palmyra, New York, Kirtland, Ohio, uh, Jackson County, Missouri, Far West, Missouri, Nauvoo, Illinois, on to um, Utah. Huh? On to Utah. We, we cover every, all the history from those areas generally uh -huh. and, uh, and no further. But what you kind of specialize in or, or what you've researched is some of the success of the Latter-day Saints outside of these places, uh -huh. particularly in kind of the Delaware Valley, Philadelphia area. Mm -hmm. So this is a story that we I, I'm willing to bet nobody's heard before. I hadn't heard I of it. Nobody's heard maybe, I think a maybe few people may have read my article. <laughs> nine, okay, okay, that's true. But I wrote a few. <laughs> I, I, will say, I will say our audience is generally a okay. little younger. All right, I got you, I got you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, I'll tailor that to 99 point. Yeah, yeah. Two I think my parents know about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so maybe you can give us a rundown on this. Okay. So maybe talk to us about um, where Latter-day Saint missionaries were uh -huh. successful generally, uh -huh. and maybe a little bit about why, and, and talk to us about this Delaware Valley area, the Delaware yeah, yeah, yeah. Valley Saints. Mm-hmm. Right, so it's an interesting thing, and because, you know, I'm working on, maybe I'll turn this into a book someday, but uh, I wanted to get a little more background, so just, just... What you know, I had the same same assumptions as you. What had happened was I I, I had bought a, a duplicate book from uh, BYU Library was 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 selling off duplicate books that, that they were getting rid of, and it was a it was a series of uh, it had been it had been printed, and it was a series of of uh, missionaries Presbyterian missionaries in the eighteen forties from Princeton. Basically, part of their training was to go out into the hinterland and 
and preach to the rural people who were seen as kind of hickish and stuff. Anyway, and, uh, you know, a few pages in, it, it starts talking about, yeah, there's all these Mormons at the Toms Rivers, New Jersey, uh, and uh, which is a decent-sized town, but I hadn't heard of it at the time. Um, is that near the Pine Barrens? Uh... The Pine Barrens, kind of. I, I probably kind of mislabeled that art. That, that was the first article I'd written. That's okay, because I love the term Pine Barrens. Well, it's just it's got a, something to it. Technically, all these places weren't actually in the Pine Barrens, but near it. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of a, an infertile area. with sandy and... Anyway. But, it's got uh, a cool name. But it's it's near it. Uh, Tom Trimmer's out on the coast. Uh, yeah. It's a decent-sized town now. Uh, they were successful in some other towns as well that are they're still quite small. Hornets Town in New Egypt are, are quite small. Uh, Tom Trigger is a decent sized town. Um, anyway, uh, so that became kind of my project, looked it all up, and I had the same assumption as you. What, what, what do you mean there's a bunch of Mormons? It turned out there's like over a hundred, hmm. like in this branch in Tom's River. And then and then they also talk about these in these other branches, Hornerstown, New Jer in, in New Egypt, which were around a hundred as well. Again, it kind of blew my mind, like, what do you mean there's just a bunch of And you know, so so from that I discovered, you know, kind of the misconception that we have is sort of the idea that uh, well, where all the Mormons come from, right? Missionaries go out, they convert people, and my assumption was uh, that I think probably isn't uncommon, you know, people, you know, they, they convert, they sell their farms, and, and they move. But in the reality, I had found that very few people did that quickly. Um, and it was hard, as you can imagine. It was quite hard to do it quickly, and a lot of people weren't doing that quickly. Um, and so they would form churches, you know, we would call them branches, but they didn't use that term very much uh, back in the earliest days of the church. They would call them churches, and they often we just referred to them collectively as the churches abroad. And there were a lot of them. In fact, one of the things that perhaps is one of the reasons why we don't know so much about them is this is a little interesting tidbit that I found, is that um, there was never any, a, a very good system to keep track of them. Hmm. Um, all of our cowdry seemed to be interested in that. And, and, and so if you go for the early, church's early periodicals, you'll see him, and then also their early minutes, you'll see a number of things from Cowdery saying, we've got to set this in order, we've got to set this in order. My feeling from it is that Joseph Smith wasn't very interested in that. His attitude was, come here. And that's another reason why we perhaps don't know so much about them is because they were a little bit ephemeral. So, so, so you would have branches that would be, or churches, right, which would be around a number of years, maybe a decade, maybe even more. But, but they were always discouraged to build meeting houses because they were always told to send their money to help build the temple. The, the church actually didn't build meeting houses. Um, in fact, uh, or very rarely. The first one was probably actually in this New Jersey area. Really? And I can maybe get to that, yeah. Um, unless there's been more scholarship since I did this, but uh, hmm. but yeah, no. It was assumed that the first one was in uh, Ramus, Illinois, and the placard says uh, in uh, built in the summer of '43, which again seems rather late. And I've yeah. talked to a lot of people. Wow, like we really didn't build it yet. No, no, they would just meet out outside during the summer and then in people's houses during the winter. And again, if there's been. I did this research about 10 years ago, if anyone's found anything new since then. But <laughs> what I have found that was interesting is that they did build churches, but little simple things, in New Jersey. Um, and they built one in Hornerstown and then one in Toms River. And we don't have the date for the Hornerstown one, but the Toms River one, um, a missionary said, he writes this in November 42, we met a new chapel built by Mr. Ivans, who was one of the... He actually didn't convert, but a lot of his family did. And uh, they're... This is uh, Heber J. Grant's ancestors and family. Um, and uh, he was a wealthy guy, and he apparently built, built him some chapels. Uh, and so that was 42, whereas the sign says, you know, Ramus being the first one in 43, so that would technically make this one earlier. So mm -hmm. it's no longer there. Uh, but we do have uh, – someone actually did, did some drawings of him, so hmm. we have that. So that's kind of fun. Um, so, yeah, they were told don't build uh, – there would, yeah, we have a, a letter from someone in Ohio. There was an Ohio branch that set up, said, hey, can we build a chapel here? And they said, you can, but don't spend much money on it because we don't want you to be there very long. Yeah. You know, move in, and if you got it, you know, if you got any money left or over, send it to the temple. Yeah. And so that also made it so they didn't leave much of an imprint, right? If they're not building buildings, they're mm. not, you know, so that's kind of ephemeral, but... Uh, that's a good point. Um, how, how would you know, you know, that'd be tough history to dig up. If there was nothing to dig up. <laughs> well, yeah, it makes it a little less so, right? Um, there are LDS in the late 1800s built built a chapel that actually, in New Jersey, New Egypt, New Jersey, that's still there. But I guess that wasn't wasn't ours ever. But, uh, but yeah, one of the things that I also found, was, which was quite interesting, is that the local historians 
knew all about this, Mormons, and particularly in New Jersey. Uh, this was not a highly populated area, and the church did quite well there, and they were they were really startled by this. And uh, why, like, why did they do so well? Well, so so I'm just going to come to this particular spot. This is actually the question I wanted to to analyze when I did my master's thesis, right? Um, what theories had been around about who converted and why, and and how good were these theories, right? And there had been uh, some scholarship that had come from, uh, well, this is kind of older. Mario de Pillis, I think, had written maybe in the 70s, and then uh, Nathan Hatch had written in the late 80s, uh, where they had actually put out kind of the notion. And the idea is kind of, I mean, it's kind of a, you know, we might even have this about, about religions that we think are a little strange and why would people join? The assumption would be, well, these are, they're not very smart, they're not very, they're not very wealthy, or all these kinds of stuff. And so they would throw those kinds of ideas around as well. And what I noticed, and uh, I was pointing actually to this, I got some mentoring from Steve Harper on this, who, who had done some uh, similar work in some other areas. I'm going to uh, pitch. Jake, Jake <laughs> is behind the camera right now. He's the guy on our podcast, and he had Steve Harper on recently. If you haven't seen that episode, go check it out because <laughs> Steve Harper is great. Anyways, continue. Yeah, he had, he had done some of this, and he, he pointed me to some of the scholarship and some of the questions. Yeah, we know it's the same thing. That those the People had laid out those, these assumptions, and they would use these words, disenfranchised, uh, uh, you know, perpetually mobile, you know, they, they, rootless, groundless, you know, and then we would go through and we'd look at, you know, Boy, they would, you know, Hatch, I think, only mentioned six people. And, you know, Harper had noticed this as well, uh, but me too, which was, and, and they weren't particularly poor or, you know, uprooted from the community or this kind of stuff. And I can't remember all the people that they mentioned, but I think the Knights were one of them who were actually, fairly, uh, you know, fairly well off, relatively, right? And then what I wanted to do was to kind of say, okay, we, you can't just get an impression, right? If they're poor, what does that mean? Poorer than what? The question is, you got to be, you got to do, Comparatively, hmm. are they poorer than their than the average person in their community, or are they wealthier than the average person in the community? And, and, and Steve pointed me to some of this as well. So I, I was able to go back there to the area and go through some of the tax records. Hmm. Okay, and I found that uh, you know who the people were, and then compare. Then you know I, I wrote down all the tax information and did like the median and the mean and all this kind of stuff. Right. And it turned out that the Mormons. Uh, Listen, on the taxes were, a little, little, were, were, were somewhat wealthier than the community, so this notion that they were poor is false. That's, but, that's really interesting because I, I did a video a while back on just kind of um, anti-religious dialogue. What I did was I compared the ancient Greek philosopher anti-Christian Celsus, uh -huh. what he says uh, about Christians to what early critics of Latter-day Saints said about Latter-day huh. Saints. And one of the common things was, Oh, these people that convert to this new cult are just, uh, they're just from the dregs of society, right? Like they're the poor people. They're, they're the people that had nowhere else to go. But you're finding evidence that at least in this area, that was not the case at all. That was not the case. No, again, I haven't studied all other areas, so I can't, I can't, uh, let me tell you some, actually some interesting things I found. Um, they were, they were wealthier on average. Uh, and, um, but the, the, the thing was, and this is actually something I had tried to propose before is that. The local people who would comment them, the newspapers and the local historians would said this too. That one the, of the line was, they're getting some of the best people of our society. And so originally I was like going to my, you know, advice, hey, well, isn't this anything? Like, no, 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 you got to show the numbers. So I went and got the numbers and it was true, right? And so uh, that, that, was, that was the thing. Of course, there would be, there would be a cross-section. You get all different kinds of people. But uh, in one of these areas, they did get one of the guys who was... On the tax records in his county, he was the second wealthiest person, and he was one of the one of the more wealthy people to join the church. His name was Edward Hunter, who who became the presiding bishop. I believe he's the longest serving presiding bishop in the church. Hmm. You know, you know, back then you would serve a really long time, right? Yeah, and he he was quite wealthy and and, and uh, donated quite a bit of money to Nauvoo to really uh, really get it up. In fact, uh, his his story is that he told Joseph he went to Joe Smith and told him he could have absolutely everything. And Joe Smith said, no, 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 you can keep some, you're giving it up, you're very good. And, you know, so it's, hmm. that's uh, Edward Hunter's story. Um, so even though these people are kind of out in the boonies a little bit relative to Kirtland and Nauvoo, et cetera, they're still influencing the main body. Well, somewhat. I think by that time he had moved. But, but there's actually, okay. um, there were actually a number of letters that are in um, the History of the Church volumes between Hunter and Joseph Smith hmm. in which Hunter is saying, well, what do you need? And Joseph Smith saying, giving him like a list of things, 
you know, so at this point, Hunter took, took a little bit to, you know, convert. He took him like like a year. I guess that was considered kind of a long time back then. People would often do it quickly, but he was about a year after the after the Mormons first showed up. In fact, he was, Joe Smith is then in the area when he uh, goes to D.C. He drops by mm-hmm. the area and organized branches and spends some time with Edward Hunter. Okay. Hunter actually wasn't quite a member yet when, when they were... Uh, in conversations, but uh, but afterwards, yeah, there's there's these letters in which he's saying, "What do you need?" He, he says, "We need store goods and that kind of thing." And uh, and I do think that they played a role in helping because uh, because Hunter was perhaps the wealthiest, but he wasn't that unusual. There was a number of wealthy people. Mm-hmm. Now, to the question of why did they join? Here's another little fact that I found. Right, because I was I was quite interested in that question. Right, if it isn't this, then what is it? And I wanted you know, and sometimes scholarship would. You know, there are certain more answers that sometimes we, we letters in sort of like, right? But they're not really quantifiable or they, you know, mm-hmm. well, it's because they're they're good or they're humble mm-hmm. or, you know, it's like, well. Righteous seekers of truth. Right. Well, how do you, how do you, how do you show that that's the case versus someone else, right? Sure. And so what I found as I was going through it was one of the things that was interesting was the fact that lots of these people, and this is a heavy Quaker area. This is where the Quakers had settled. But lots of these people had, they weren't Quakers themselves, but their parents or grandparents had been. And I saw that a lot of people, lots and lots and lots and lots, including Edward Hunter, hmm. right? So I started to kind of gather all that data. I went through lots of uh, genealogical stuff. I said, you know, there's really a trend here. And they even use a term in the area for it. And I don't know how broadly, if, if, if this is used more broadly, but uh, they would often call it, you know, a Quaker who wasn't fully practicing. Because the Quakers had de- uh, adopted a number of kind of peculiar traits. You would use the in thou. Mm. You dress really plain. You wouldn't take your hat off when you went indoors. Um, mm. You wouldn't barter. That was, Quakers actually started the non-bartering thing and all this stuff. So, so you could kind of act like a Quaker, but they also had really strict rules on whether or not you were actually in, particularly around marriage. So some people would, would still have Quaker tendencies. Uh, oh, yeah, you wouldn't refer to uh, monks. You would give them a number, not a, not a name, mm. uh, that kind of stuff. Mm. And so uh, and they refer to these guys as Hickory Quakers. It was kind of like a Jack Mormon we would use now. I think that's kind of a similar kind of thing. Hickory Quakers. Hickory Quakers. And, and so the early missionaries say, yeah, we showed up, but mainly the people who were showing up were Hickory Quakers. Hmm. They were mentioned, which was included this, this Edward Hunter. And what I had found was that, that religious background mattered. Hmm. Okay? So Quaker was one of them, but I also found another, uh, another uh, tendency, and it was mainly in New Jersey, which was a lot of Methodist joining. And that was actually fairly common. For, for the church in general, a lot of Methodists. And so I went and looked at kind of what was going on with those two denominations. There was some upheaval, which often happens in churches, of, of, of feeling like there were shifts. And, and in Methodism, there was a feeling like there was kind of an imposition of, of needing to be more orderly and more uh, respectable, hmm. which some had felt like was quashing the spirit. Hmm. Okay? okay. And so a lot of Methodists were kind of looking for, well, is there something else out there that's, that's got this, you know? Hmm. Quakers had had uh, a lot of schisms and, and things, and there was a feeling among a lot of them that they had imposed what, what was often referred to as quietism, um, that uh, you, were, you aren't really supposed to be very involved in the world. You, we, we wait for the Spirit to, to let us know. Mm. And a lot of Quakers had felt like, like, you know, you're not supposed to be involved in any fighting or any wars, so you're not going to be involved in revolution or, or these kinds of things. And a lot had kind of felt like, why aren't these things important? Why can't we go out and fight for religious liberty and that kind of stuff? And and then if you did, you would get kicked out, right? Mm. So there were those who kind of had this heritage, and, and the spirit is very important in Quakerism, who had kind of had this heritage. And, and also early Quakers in England had been very severely persecuted. Mm. And so Hunter even says this. His father says his father told me, hey, you know, what church should I join? His father had left the Quakers himself. Oh, well, yeah, find the church, you know, that is really, really gets persecuted. Well, the Mormons show up <laughs> in 38 when terrible stuff's going on in Missouri. And there was a lot of sympathy in the area, right? Even those who really didn't like Mormonism thought that, you know, it was terrible when it happened to them, right? Well, for a lot of people, they were like, well, maybe this is the true church because isn't this what the church should be like? Mm, that's really interesting. So, so, so I guess um, maybe just to wrap up here, I've got one more big question and you've, you've segued into it quite nicely. Okay. We know that the church in Missouri, not, not good. Good things do not generally happen. It does not result in good things. They get yeah. kicked out of Missouri yeah. and whatnot. Uh, what happens to this group of, of saints in the Delaware area? I mean, obviously there are a lot fewer of them there than in Missouri, but you also mentioned that there's a lot of sympathy for them there. It, okay. If the, the church was very successful. It would cause a kerfuffle wherever they went. They weren't 
no one's being driven out by gunpoint, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're just not threatening. The reason why they're getting driven out of these other areas is because this kind of weird group, where are they up to? But they're growing very, very rapidly. They're mm -hmm. coming in from outside. They're always outsiders, right? They weren't, they weren't converting Missourians. They just show up there, right? Mm -hmm. And if you just kind of think about if you're in your own community, let's say you're in a small community and this new religion shows up and every couple of months they double in size, you know, you would be like, who are these guys? You know, mm. it might make you feel uneasy. Well, that doesn't happen in these areas. You know, they are bothered by how successful they were. And so they would call out the local preachers and denounce them. And then, and, 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 you know, debates were very, very common among these things. But yeah, they're not driven out. In fact, they're even, they were even bothered by the gathering policy. Like, because again, that's also kind of, that's very weird for most churches. What, you're, you're moving? Mm. You know, you know, a lot of people would move west anyway. But there was always this feeling of, again, you know, a whole... Families weren't uniform, right? It would split up families. And that, that, that often bothered a lot of people. And then, you know, sometimes, there, like I said, there were wealthy people here. And there was a feeling of, well, you got to take our best people, you mm. know. And so, so it was actually kind of interesting. Um, a lot of local histories kind of say, you know, we're a little bothered by what, why the Mormons got to take these people mm. um, is more of a thing. But, yeah, and then also this was, you know, it could vary in terms of reception, right? In the South, there, there were more, you know, threats of tar and feathering and that kind of stuff. This was this was a quite quite community. Quite yeah. peaceful, very open to religious tolerance. That that had been Pennsylvania's uh MO from the beginning. And so they would talk about, you know, ruffians being outdoors, yelling stuff at them and that kind of thing. They would run into that kind of stuff. But yeah, there was never any sense of, yeah, we're being driven out. Hmm. So so what would happen is um over time people would move. A lot of people would stick around. Um so, so this, this goes, uh, so they have a presence throughout the 40s and then even into the 50s. But in time, uh, you know, more of your stalwarts have left, right? Right. They're going kind out of, west to Utah. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the back row people are kind of hanging out, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, you know, so it's a little less stalwart, particularly in 53. That's when uh, uh, Heber J. Grant's family goes. And, uh, and that, was, that was a real kind of blow. Uh, and so you have, again, fewer and fewer people, but... So, uh, when, so when we talk about these saints in, in near in the Philly area, uh -huh. uh, this is uh, that's rather this is Heber J. Grant's family. And Heber J. Grant ends uh -huh. up becoming the president of the church. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people came from all over. I mean, Joe Smith was not from Kirtland or no, no, right? Sure, because sure. from okay, so Palmyra, obviously that's important. But you know, I mean, no president was born. At least in the, the first presidents, they were all born all over, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, Brigham Young was... I just didn't know that about that Hebrew J. Grant. That's interesting. So over time, as the Saints move west, a lot of the more stalwart members in the Philly area also move west. Yeah. And, and they also become a waste. Uh, you know, so, some of the British Mormons go through there. Mm, okay. um, so, so that becomes a bit of a story as well. It's kind of like an outpost. Yeah, the, yeah. Well, the well, they, they like the facts. They have branches, you know, they branches in New York and Boston and this kind of stuff. And, and, and they, they like to send them up uh, the Mississippi River, but there was a cholera breakout. And so mm. there was a time period where they had to send them to the to the East Coast. But uh, so, yeah, there was just kind of a slow kind of dying down. Um, but, but you know, they, they point out that, like, apparently the 1890 census, Tom's River still had... 20 people or so saying that they were LDS, hmm. even though they hadn't really been meeting, but they yeah. still saw that designation. One of the things, I, a little tidbit that I found interesting is I had found two women from Tom's River who did this. And this, I can't remember the exact dates, but it's, it's, it's the late 1800s, like 1880s and 90s, who traveled to Utah, took out their endowments, and then traveled back to New Jersey. Really? Yeah. Because they were both married to non-Mormons, uh -huh, right? Okay. So they, you know, sometimes, sometimes families would, you know, marriages would split up. That was more often men doing that than women. It wasn't very common for women to leave their husbands over, over it. Although that happened a couple of times. But, sure. but yeah, so I thought that was really interesting to, you know, kind of, you that's know, a, the that's pilgrimage, a, yeah. That's kind of a lot. It is a pilgrimage. It's, it's quite <laughs> yeah. a journey to Salt yeah, Lake is. and yeah. back. But so uh, maybe just to conclude here, maybe we can look at this branch uh, or, or the saints in the Philly area as kind of a, a representation of what's happening to branches on a more widespread basis in the East. What happened to these branches after the church moved West? Okay, so after Utah? Yeah. All right, so things are okay. So things are a little bit in disarray due to, uh, you know, succession, right? So Joe Smith killed... And Brigham Young's really able to button things down in, in, in Nauvoo. Well, a lot of the claimants do go east because there's a lot of members there and, and money. And so Strang is there really quick. And, you know, even guys who had pretty short claims like William Smith 
Um, he's there and he causes all kinds of problems even when he was in the church because he, he was kind of like a rogue polygamy practicer. He would just propose to everybody mm. willy-nilly. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he, that's a whole other story. Maybe you want to, you don't have to put that in. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other story. But the bottom line, things were kind of chaotic of, okay, that was way to polygamy, right? Because they were trying to keep that hush-hush. Well, there's, there's stories of like in New Jersey where some missionary shows up, maybe he was grappling with the issue, who knows, but he tells the whole branch, boom, the whole branch apostatized, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that was actually, that was a big, a big issue. Um, they even talked about certain apostates who had learned about it, who were really upset, you know, maybe like now in some division, why didn't I know about this? Well, there was uh, certain people who would, uh, who, who it was reported they were going door to door to every member's house and telling them mm -hmm. about, about me. Well, it creates a lot of chaos. Um, they're still around. The big, big shift is uh, 1861. Civil War breaks out, right? Well, Joe mm -hmm. Smith had his, his prophecy, right, about this would be kind of, you know, terrible, terrible things, but also like this is kind of, I mean, the way it kind of sounds, the Civil War prophecy is this is kind of the apocalypse, mm. right? Leading up to the second coming. Almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. War will be poured out on all nations. And the reports are something like 2,000 people come out of the East at that point. What, they go out west to Utah. Yeah, yeah, because the feeling was... Flee design, right? What the scriptures say, mm. you know. Otherwise, it make. I mean, the scripture makes it sound like yeah, everything's gonna be on fire, you know. Right. So yeah, a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of people left at that point. Um, and then yeah, just little trickles of people, like I said afterwards. Um, the RLDS do when they form, they do go to Philadelphia and, and get a branch going because there 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 were a fair amount of members there, mm -hmm. you know. And of course, they could show up with a claim of we're not doing polygamy. And like I said, they, they built some chapels there. I don't think that they, yeah, they didn't end up being continuous. The one that's built in New Egypt ended up being sold to the Catholics. It's still there, but it was built in like the 1870s. But I think about just the, the logistical difficulties of maintaining branches, uh, these churches across the East, especially when you're in Utah territory, right? Like you've got people hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away. How do you minister to them? How do you make sure that they're, you know, up to date on what's happening, things like that? And then I think back, you know, to ancient Christianity, to the times of the apostles and uh, and how difficult that must have been then for the apostles to go and manage all these different churches all over the place. And I'm just grateful for cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Civil War also just created a whole thing of we don't want to be sending anybody back there, you know. Sure. Um, they would set up, I have to look at the exact details, but they, they had an ongoing Eastern States mission and they also had a Northern States mission. I can't remember exactly which was which and at what times, but I think it was uh, pretty regular, usually based in New York, and they would try to send people down and over, but uh, they had a lot of territory to cover. And then it was also one of the things that's, that's worth noting is that this was all really, really dwarfed by England. When they show up in England, the success there, you know, like I said, quite successful in Delaware Valley, but everybody who went to England said, you know, we've never seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, from the early times, the Eastern branches, there was just never regulation in order to it. It wasn't something that Joseph Smith was very interested in. Mm -hmm. his, his attitude was just, you know, come here. And when when and, and send your money and that kind of stuff. Oliver Cowdery made some attempts to do this in the early years, but for some reason, and I'd like to know more about this, um, the, uh, the church in England was hyper organized, and I've been told this may have been to do to Brigham Young um, had had kind of a more of a sense of that. But, Sounds like a Brigham Young thing. <laughs> but it, 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 you know, they had, you know, just everything was, was listed out. They, you know, they broke them all into units and, you know, so they had this conference system, a conference being like a unit that you would be within and, and everything was regulated with branches and everything was hierarchical from the top. And uh, particularly after the apostles do their mission, maybe, maybe not right at the beginning, but so super hyper organized where that just never happened in these Eastern ones, just because, like I said, it wasn't so much Joe Smith's interest and also... There were there was you know the metaphor of you know building the plane while you're in air. Mm. This was all happening while Joe Smith was just trying to figure out his own hierarchy. Sure. And so it was really run by the elders. They would just hold their own meetings because they rarely got much direction. So they would say, okay, we're just going to call a meeting, and they, they, they would go ahead and uh, they do the ordinations for new people. You know, so so preacher advancement would happen in their in their meetings and stuff. So it was often the case when the 12 get called and they're supposed to be in charge of this, well, they can never figure out how to do it here because mm. it was just kind of too messy. And, and England was just seemed so much more important because it was much bigger. 
but they often just talk about, yeah, we're running into all these people who we've never met, you mm. know? Yeah. Um, anyway, it's, That's so it's interesting. fun stuff. Thank you for telling that story. Before <laughs> we end, uh, do you have anything else you wanted, wanted to say? Any other thoughts? I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure. Okay, great. I think I'm good. Nothing, so, nothing pressing. Potentially, in, in coming years, coming decades, maybe, we might see a book from you on this kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hopefully. Cool. Yeah. Um, where can people turn to learn more about this if they want to? Well, uh, in terms of all the stuff on the, you know, the, the, the map book they put out, I don't know, what was it, eight, eight, ten years ago, has, has maps of all kinds of things, including these branches that were sk- spread around. What's the map book? I think it's calling mapping Latter Day Saint history or something. That actually, that sounds familiar. So that's 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 that will give you a bit of an overview. Uh, then I have a number of articles. There's the New Jersey one again. It's a little problem. It's the first thing I ever wrote. It's got a few <laughs> little things. But then I've got uh, got my master's thesis. But uh, but I have uh, an article uh, in Religion and American Culture called uh, Reformable Day Reformer Radicalism. Sorry, I should have checked this. Why don't I know the name of my stuff? Uh, so that talks about this the idea of of, of the success here and why they're success and it goes through all that you know the, the the tax numbers and that kind of stuff and then i got one called discord in the city of brotherly love it turns out which we didn't get to this story but uh, even though the philadelphia branch i mentioned this to you before was the largest north american branch outside of nauvoo they again they had larger branches in england uh but i don't know why this is the case but you can read my article but uh they uh had terrible infighting to the point that they broke into two separate branches and refused to meet with each other. Really? Yeah. This, this is the Philly area? Philly, Philly, no, the, the, the Philadelphia branch, branch. the okay. one in the city, which actually got up to 300 members at one point, pretty Dang. decent size. But uh, yeah, it was so severe, and they were always sending letters back to Nauvoo, you know, about how horrible either one was, and they, you know, they didn't really know what to do with it. They would... They would just send out leaders. And one of the things is that in the early days, the branches elected all their own leaders. There wasn't any hierarchy to, to come in and appoint because they, they, there was no system put in place. So they elected their own leaders until Joseph Smith started saying more and more to Brigham Young, I don't want to deal with this thing at all. Mm-hmm. Not just Philadelphia, but just, just all these branches. You're the head of the 12. You deal with it. He so, delegates it. Yeah, he started to say, okay, I'm going to put my own people in. And so he sends out Jedediah Grant to be in charge of the Philadelphia branch, and he's able to whip them all to shape. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> we've got to put that, we'll make sure we put that resource in the description so you can read more about that story. I'll, I'll email you the correct titles. Today. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Steve, thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. All right. Everyone, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Check out some of Steve's work, and we'll see you next time.